we're going to go ahead and start. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are really thrilled to be here today. Um, we want to thank you for joining us. We are grateful to be here, and we'd like to thank the communities of Edmonton for hosting us. Um, it's, an honor to, it's an honor to be visitors in this beautiful place that is enhanced by the warmth of community that is truly unparalleled. We also want to thank the Sloan Foundation that helps make it possible for us to experience this community here with you. My name is Shira Siegel. I am at MIT OpenCourseWare. I'm the Collaborations and Engagement Manager. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce you to um, those of us today that are going to be talking about planning, planned communities, building the foundation for successful cross-institution open collaborations. Should we start with you, Sarah? Sure. Hi. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Hansen. I'm the Senior Manager for Open Education and Strategic Initiatives at MIT OpenCourseWare. Good morning. And for those of you online with us, good day, good evening. I'm so happy to have you with us. My name is Lisa Young, and I serve as the Faculty Administrator for Open Education and Innovation at the Maricopa Community Colleges in Phoenix, Arizona in the United States. And I also serve as Vice President of OE Global, um, who are throwing this great party and conference that we're experiencing. Indeed. Good morning, everybody. James Galapagos Clagg with College of the Canyons, one of the California community colleges at uh, Canyons. I serve as Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Online Education. And like everybody else, I'm just so thrilled to be here. Isn't this awesome to be together? And just looking out in this audience, again, for those of you who are here in person, it's awesome to see so many friends and familiar faces. So uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Wonderful. Uh, our agenda for today in this hour is to give an overview of the collaboration that we are doing across institutions, uh, to highlight some of our faculty insights and have a discussion about some of those insights that faculty are bringing to us. We'll have an open Q&A and discussion, and we also have some resources that we want to share with you. James, do you want to talk about the objectives of the sure, project? Sure, absolutely. And, and before I, I mention the objectives of the project, I, I just want to say how honored I am, and I think uh, Lisa as well, you know, to, to have been invited to collaborate with our colleagues at MIT. MIT has been a shining light of open education for well over a decade. So it's just fantastic to uh, be here with the, the colleagues from MIT. Uh, so the, the objectives of the project you see up on the screen, uh, first of all, to develop um, to develop and support new collaborations. Really, it's, it's exploring the potential for collaborations uh, between these types of institutions. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, to adapt and enhance OER that exists in open courseware at MIT. Of course, we all have known and admired the work that MIT has done over the years. Uh, in particular, we're interested in exploring the use and adaptation of open courseware materials with students and with students in community colleges. Uh, and finally, to learn about the use or reuse of these materials in different contexts. So uh, just sort of defining the terms a little bit, uh, we have two community colleges, Maricopa Community College District and College of the Canyons in uh, Maricopa in Arizona and Com College of the Canyons in California. Um, our community colleges, and if you're not familiar with that, with the, what that means, it means we're proudly open access institutions. We proudly accept the top 100% of students who come to us. Um, and, you know, in contrast, you know, just to play with the contrast a second, I think MIT would probably not describe itself as probably accepting the top 100% of, of applicants. So quite different institutions, research-heavy institution, research-focused institution, and then very teaching-centric institutions. Um, and just a quick show of hands from the folks in the room. Would you describe your institution as teaching-focused? Hands up if you describe your institution as teaching-focused. Okay, so the majority, I would say, and how about research-focused institutions. Okay, good, good number. Anybody, anybody at one of those institutions where you have to or you're expected to do both high-quality teaching and research? Oh, that's, so quite a few here. That, that's a heavy load. Thank you for that. So we've got a great mix of folks in the room. Appreciate that. Uh, and then back to, back over to Lisa, I think. 
Yes, so I'm going to um, share a little bit about this collaboration. And so what's very exciting about this, and really I think we all, all of us here today online and in the room, the magic of open education is really the ability to collaborate, to be able to adapt that remixing, that reuse, like that's the magic. That's what gets me so excited about what we can do and having heard Cable's discussion this morning. You know, it's all about the collaboration that we can solve these big, pro big, these big problems. And so when we were approached by MIT um, to be engaged and involved in this um, project, first of all, I was like, whoa, MIT is calling yeah, us. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and I've admired um, OCW. I actually did part of my dissertation using OCW courseware. And so it was very exciting 15 years later to be able to like revisit this. Um, but what was so exciting about this was that we were going to have our faculty collaborating with the amazing MIT team and just such talented individuals and our faculty were going to be collaborating among themselves with College of the Canyons in Maricopa to really look at how we can leverage the open courseware. What excited me the most about this project is that we're also looking at how the faculty use those materials and how they adapt them and what they're thinking about. As you know, um, many years ago, Paul Stacy, who's here, and I were, say, were at a conference with Cable Green, and he said, everybody wants a video on XYZ. There's thousands of them out there, but no one wants to use the thousands that are out there. They want to make their own. But what we know is that the magic is about this collaboration, this reuse, and we're really going to be able to dive into that reuse while having those faculty collaborating with each other across institutions with MIT. And so it's, it's a really very exciting aspect of this project. And so with that, we did a call for proposals. So James did a call for interest. Um, Maricopa did a call for interest. We brought them all together with MIT. And when we looked at the faculty who were interested in this project, we had a huge realm of interest. And we had so many faculty come to our interest party online. And um, you can see those subjects of interest, everything from anthropology, history, psychology, chemistry. We also had faculty from the film school. There were so many different faculty who wanted to learn more about engaging with MIT OpenCourseWare. Um, when it came down to it, um, thanks to the Sloan Foundation, we did have funding to fund a very specific number of faculty um, to engage them in this work. And when it came down to it, you'll see that we awarded, we actually awarded three faculty in history which was so interesting because, you know, like when I think of MIT, I think of a lot of subject areas, but I don't always think history. Um, but we have from the sciences to the communications, um, a really like wide um, array of disciplines that are going to be engaging with the open courseware. Can, can I add something about, about uh, recruiting faculty, or the call for participation and the interest? Uh, I certainly found this at College of the Canyons in my institution, Faculty showed up for learning more, to information session, learning more about this project, and ultimately participating in this project. Faculty whose doors I have knocked on for years, and they have not been interested in OER. And certainly, it wasn't the financial aspect of this. This is not the faculty are not receiving a tremendous amount of money. Uh, it's, but to a large extent, I think it's the prospect of working with MIT materials that there is no doubt a certain cachet there that helped to attract or get the attention of many of our teaching faculty mm -hmm. who otherwise were not you know, answering my calls at least. So I would suggest that is if, if you consider these kinds of cross-institutional partnerships or collaborations, that's, that's a real element. You know, don't, don't ignore sort of the, the marketing element of those you partner with. And um, I, one of the things that happened between our, our information party and selecting the faculty is that um, the MIT team screened the disciplines and the subject areas that the faculty wanted to cover to determine if there, were, if there were materials for them to leverage. And so we ended up starting with a big pool, it got smaller, and then there was the selection. Perfect. 
Should we talk about the professional development uh, Canvas OER course that yeah. your team developed? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so one of the things that we thought was important to, to provide uh, to all of the participants was a baseline. Uh, as I said, it, it, in my institution at least, a lot of the folks who raised their hands had not been involved in our local OER efforts before. Uh, and I think maybe that's also true for Maricopa. So, so we wanted to provide this baseline knowledge of OER. So uh, thanks to my fabulous colleague, Joy Shoemate there at College of the Canyons, uh, our team developed a, a, you know, put together a, an intro to OER course pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and uh, th that we, in which we enrolled all of the participants in this program and we expected them to work through that course. It's a self-paced course, but we expected them to work through that course under a certain timeline so that they would be ready to for the next stage of the project. And the course, as we all here might expect, and we all probably have these kinds of courses for our institutions, uh, module one is intro to OER and intro to open, open, uh, open pedagogy. Module two is open licensing. Module, th module three is finding and using OER in your teaching. Uh, and then sort of next steps, what are you gonna do next uh, in your own teaching practice? Uh, but with that, with that uh, you know, estimated three or four week uh, self-paced experience, we felt as though we had everybody on the same page. And, and one of the really nice notes of feedback that I received from one of our very veteran uh, OER authors who is participating in the program was that she actually learned some stuff from the course, which was great. <laughs> yeah. so I took that as a great compliment that one of our <laughs> veterans said that. And it was really interesting because we got unsolicited feedback also about how great the course wa was. So Joy, really great job. And we have made the course available to you at the end. We have a QR code that you can go in and see the course and then it's available through Cam Canvas Commons for you to adapt as you need. So we're really grateful for that license that you put on that. Part of this was um, a guided discovery and curation efforts that was a whole team effort, as Lisa was saying. So we um, preemptively tried to determine if we had enough material in MIT OpenCourseWare to align with the topics and courses that people were selecting. So um, for example, I'll just give you one of the many examples. Um, one of your instructors is teaching a positive psychology course, the science and art of well-being. So we happen to have a course on the art and science of happiness. Our introduction to psychology course is really interesting. Ethics in your life, being, doing, being thinking, doing, or not doing, um, as well as courses on social psychology, moral psychology, the meaning of life, affect, <laughs> right? A course on feelings. Um, so this is one of the ways that we might guide one instructor into some of the potential material. Um, and then I have consultations with them and we go through the material. Some of our digital publication specialists, when they're able, join in these consultations and we just have a conversation about what might be available or at times they might not even be necessarily adapting or adopting the material but be inspired by the structure or to get ideas. Um, so the guided discovery and curation efforts is kind of ongoing and we're in the middle of it right now. Uh, there's one other thing that makes the project really unique and that's ongoing reflective practices that Sarah will talk about. Yeah, thank you. I think one of the threads that really connected our institution is the idea that OER are only as powerful as the people who use them. And often storytelling is a powerful motivator for people to take up OER. So if you hear a story that you can relate to or that inspires you, you might try it yourself. So we, know we've, we knew we wanted to incorporate a storytelling element throughout. So we designed um, opportunities for faculty to participate in structured interviews at three points during this project. So there's an interview at the beginning stages before they've really begun their adaptation. I'll do more interviews with them in the middle of the project and then again at the end. And we'll put those stories together as podcasts for dissemination to share openly with the world what this collaborative process was like, how they actually went about adapting um, the materials from their own perspectives. So people will be hearing not from us, <laughs> but from the faculty themselves who are engaged in the work. And if you advance the slide, this is the map that we're using. And I think what was important is that we developed the interview protocol together. So Lisa and James both had input into what kinds of questions would be asked, what kind of information we would gather. Um, and it's 
I feel like the luckiest person in the world. I get to talk to these faculty individually and get their insights, and they're just so powerful. And James, I know when we met earlier, you mentioned that this particular element is kind of new to the projects you've worked on. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually curious what, what folks in the audience would say to this. Um, perhaps too often, it's the case that we introduce somebody to OER, we help them find their mat find materials, and, you know, and we help them adopt the materials, adapt the materials. We engage in the editing process, the remix process. We format for accessibility, you know, all, all of that kind of mm, almost manual technical labor uh, that we support our faculty with. But we, we, in my institution at least, we don't stop to really have a conversation with our faculty who are doing that about their process, what they're learning, how, how it impacts their teaching practice, this reflexiveness. So how does openly, how do openly licensed materials change your teaching practice or open new avenues for you? Or how does the act of searching and searching for or reviewing a whole host of new materials. How does that make you think about instructional materials differently? And so on and so forth. We, we just don't do that. Uh, and I'm, I, and, and with, with this project, we are able to, to do that. You're able to do that, thankfully, in, in, a, in a structured way. Um, and I'm curious, just with a show of hands in the audience, does anybody have that kind of reflection or conversation with your, with your faculty worked into your process of OER? No, yeah, so, you know, kudos to you if you do. Uh, I've got a, got a, a maybe out there. Uh, so I really think that's valuable, and I'm excited to see what comes out of that. Yeah, I've sort of started calling this open reflective practice because I don't think just the resources should be open. I think it should be the pedagogy itself that's open, too. Um, and I thought we'd play you a clip of what a faculty member had to say about this process. I like the reflection process built into this whole thing that we're doing, we're learning, we're thinking, we're goal setting, we're reflecting, we're, there's some formal and informal assessments along the way. I like the fact that we're going to be sharing in a lot of different ways, you know, with podcasts and with written information and that our students' viewpoints are going to be important as well. So I, I think this is checking all the boxes. So the reflective practices are one of the things that made the project really unique. Um, and the other thing was this particular pairing where we're looking at MIT material um, and you know our lush archive of material, but pairing it with community college leadership and vision because we're turning to you to show us how OER is actually done when the boots are on the ground, so to speak. And if I could just add to that, in the beginning you said like, oh, it was like an honor to work with MIT that we called you, but actually it was us. We were like, oh my God, they picked up the phone. You know, we were like, they're talking to us mm -hmm. because we really see you as leaders. And I mean, I'm sure all of you know this, but it's the infrastructure at the community colleges that is actually making this collaboration work. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. <laughs> well, well th thank you likewise. And again, for those of you who, are, who might take away the idea to engage in this kind of collaboration across different institutional types, I think it's really essential for, uh, for both parties to approach the collaboration you know, with humility and with excitement, which, which we have done, um, and, and to understand the value that, that different parties bring to the table, um, certainly with, and, and also with, with Teaching and teaching focused institutions, certainly in the, in the U.S. community colleges, we have a tremendous and have had over the past few years a tremendous focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, culturally responsive pedagogy, and one of the uh, really great attractions, I would say, in the community colleges in the U.S. these days for OER and open pedagogy is the ability to adapt materials so that they can be more culturally responsive. Uh, so there's a great interweaving of those, of those uh, approaches in the community colleges, and I know that was a at least an interest on, on the part of MIT is to, to sort of test drive uh, the, the, the OCW materials in the wild, you know, outside the confines of the ivy, ivy walls, you know, see, yes. see what happens out there in the wild. 
Yeah, and we got a lot of key learnings and themes from uh, the interviews that and the consultation work that we've done thus far. So um, we list them here, and we're going to play you examples of nearly all of these categories. We wanted to bring in as many faculty voices of those uh, that are recipients of this grant and working with us as we could. So the first is the key, uh, the key theme of community college as a democratizing force. And I will go ahead and play. Yeah. And I mean, I just want to clarify that these came out of the interviews themselves. So the, uh, the faculty themselves, they weren't aware of each other's interviews. And so across the interviews, these were the themes that were emerging. The other thing is just really living in community. Like you have multi-generational homes and coming here. And it, it's just really interesting that the student that is here that is going to college when they're going home and talking and, and with their family, that it's the first time that the other generations are hearing the college experience. And you know, it's really interesting. Um, at the Maricopa Community Colleges, we have 10 separately accredited colleges. Nine of our colleges are Hispanic serving institutions and the college that is not an HSI is the only public community college on sovereign land. Scottsdale Community College sir, sits on the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And so we serve that community. And as we look at our student populations, many of our students are first generation college students. And so when we are able to provide those open educational resources to our students, we're not just providing them to our students, we are providing them to their families, to their communities, and we're breaking down the barrier of even considering access to higher ed. We're really kind of starting that, that conversation at the at, by providing this at the community college to say, these are the materials, this is what I'm learning, I can show you, and it's pretty exciting. So for me, the take home message is if you are a research institution looking to have impact, you should look to community colleges because they are the ones <laughs> reaching people and for multiple generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next key theme is uh, it's not just a one way conversation, right? MIT has a lot to learn from community colleges. So I'm hoping that you will help spread the word that community college is an awesome place to be and that we serve our community. We not only do the first two years better than anybody else, we also do job training and career enhancement and all of that stuff. We're a community college, right? We're not a junior college, we're a community college. We serve our community and our communities have such varied needs and we take care of them. And so we should be respected, not put down. This, is, this was important to acknowledge, right? Like uh, oftentimes in the interviews, there would, there would be language like, MIT is a feather in our cap, right? And that is not how we wanted to enter this collaboration. Um, and so at the same time they were saying that, they would also say things like this. Like, we want to be respected. And so I think when you have these collaborations, you can't brush these things under the rug. You have to have open conversations about what, what is the greater social dialogue that's going on and that we have to break through. Because we are definitely leaders in producing OER, but the community colleges are leaders in using OER. So we need to have those kinds of conversations out in the open. And I'm, I don't know, Lisa and James, if you could speak to that, that tension that you have to acknowledge if you're gonna do these cross-institutional collaborations. Well, well, yes, and maybe, maybe it's a, oh, maybe, maybe a, yeah, often an unspoken tension, uh, and I don't know if it's a chip on the shoulder or insecurity of some folks in community colleges. Uh, certainly, you know, when, when I interact with colleagues at MIT or colleagues at re top research institutions, I don't, I don't get that message that they're looking down on on community colleges, but I know that a lot of community college folks have that have that sort of chip on their shoulder. Um, so, so yeah, you, again, you need to come come to a partnership, have those open conversations, yeah. acknowledge exactly as, as as you just said, Sarah, that that uh, uh, the research institution might have a lot to learn from the teaching focused institution, 
And uh, teaching focused institutions, we uh, need to understand and, and utilize the fantastic array of teaching materials that our colleagues at the research institutions have. Not only the research products and the research outputs, but also teaching materials in, in, in repositories like, like OCW. Uh, so, you know, I would certainly c encourage everyone who's thinking about a, this type of collaboration to think about your local community college teaching institutions or your local research institutions and have a conversation with them about what kinds of materials they might have that would lend themselves to use in the teaching focused institution. And it might be an opportunity if you're from a community college, you've got a strong OER program or strong OER knowledge, it might be an opportunity to educate your research neighbor about open. Maybe they aren't aware of open, maybe they aren't aware of the opportunity to license their materials, make the materials more discoverable, more uh, usable. Uh, maybe they're not aware of the, of the great example of MIT OCW even. Go ahead, Nancy. I also think that it will be it will be really interesting because uh, these podcasts will be published and shared, and I look forward to, you know, perhaps some of the MIT faculty who have developed these materials will have an opportunity to learn how they're being used at the community colleges. Yeah, absolutely, and it's our hope that the adaptations that the community college faculty make will then be linked back to the courses on open courseware from which they came, so that other people can see how the materials have been adapted and what they could do, and they could adapt the adaptations. You know, it's like share it forward. That, it, you know, we have to negotiate that with the individual faculty, faculty who build the page, but I can't imagine people not wanting to share how their work is being used out in the world. So. What well, it also occurs to me that one of the common issues or cons complaints that I hear from o o open textbook or OER authors is that they don't know what kind of use their materials are getting, right? I, I sent it out into the world, sent it out into the universe. Yeah. Who knows if anybody's using it, right? Is it any good? Is it, is it useful? So it's probably tremendously, can be tremendously gratifying for authors or creators to receive this formalized feedback, this very organic feedback, and that's certainly another uh, bonus or another potential benefit for engaging in these kinds of collaborations where you are able to have the support of folks like Sarah and Shira to document and to document the learning and have that kind of conversation. Yeah, and just one more point and then I will mute myself if I was on Zoom, I would oh, be muting dare. myself. Um, <laughs> MIT professors are intensely interested in culturally responsive teaching and becoming more culturally responsive. And so there is so much to learn from the adaptations that the faculty at College of the Canyons and Maricopa are making. So they're gonna be able to see how they could do that in their own work, their literal own work, right? And that hopefully they'll adopt those practices in the next iteration of their courses. So it's really exciting. And all of this really feeds into the value of collaboration. Would you like me to play all three of the clips yeah. in a row? Yeah. Okay, so we have three different voices, three different instructors. And again, we didn't go into the interview saying, well, let's talk about the value of collaboration. Like these are inherent themes that were just kind of coming up across the interview. Yeah. I really believe in collaboration at the institutional level. And I believe in cultural change. I teach psychology and culture. I really think that when we join forces, we become stronger. And for us as a community college to have the resources, the cloud of MIT is kind of like a feather in our caps. But more than that, I think that creating a community of learning is very important. I'm interested to see if there's anybody at our sister community college in California that might be doing something similar that I can brainstorm with. So I always learn from partnering with people. I love to do collaborative projects because I feel like it just really increases my repertoire so that I can have more options for my students, more ways to approach, approach an assignment, more ways to solve a problem. So this one is really giving me an opportunity to grow and connecting with others. Tuesday, I visited one other faculty, and she said that she's also in this program, MIT OER program. Based upon this MIT OER, we were able to talk a lot. She said, 
she's now writing some kind of oya book herself. I was wow, that's great. So I, um, I'm really hoping to be connected with MIT oya faculty, and faculty members in COC, and also another college to participate in this program. Can I come out of that, that final quote? That, that colleague is a, a brand new tenure track hire. So it's incredibly uh, you know, optimistic for me to think that someone who's a brand new hire is participating in this program um, so that OER becomes a normal part of his teaching practice. But I, ha I happen to know that the fellow faculty member he was speaking to is the chair of his tenure committee. So you know, double, valid double validation that he just mentions to the chair of his tenure committee, hey, I'm doing this, she's doing it too. Uh, so it's more validation for him that, for this new person in the institution that using OER is non-controversial, it's accepted within the department and within the discipline. So that's uh, yeah, just, just a real bonus. And I think that with the faculty, we've had them in the course. We've created an introduction so that they could get to know each other um, and share a little bit. Um, then they've been working with Shira, well, Sarah, and then Shira um, to um, curate the materials. They've had their first interview, and now they're working in that. So we're at the very start of this project. You know, there was a big selection process in getting people interested. Um, so I'm really excited about the next layers of collaboration and getting the faculty together virtually so that they can have some discussions about the work that they're doing once they've had those initial meetings with Shira. And I, it just kind of dawned on me also that we have a great opportunity in collaboration for peer review, and I'm just throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. But I think that like it could be a really great, hear, hearing that from Isaac, I think there's a, there's a big opportunity for us to do some peer review in the project as well. So, um, the, and then we hope to get all of these wonderful faculty together in person, and that will be to share their work and share their collaborations. So, so when you, when you mentioned, mentioned peer review, uh, Lisa, I wonder if this is what you meant, or it's a, this is an additional idea. Uh, so when faculty at the uh, research-focused institution perhaps are producing new instructional materials that are going to be openly licensed, they could collaborate with their peers at a teaching-focused institution to engage in peer review from the teaching perspective or the culturally responsive pedagogy perspective. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, we do work with some HBCUs, and they actually mention that idea, too. Like, that would be a really productive form of collaboration. So when I'm hearing it from multiple places, it means, like, we're, there's a kernel of a really super good idea. Right, and, and it speaks to at least the perceived strengths of the different institutions. A research institution, of course, is focused on or excels at producing new knowledge, producing new artifacts, producing new data. Uh, and the teaching focus institution, of course, focuses on the teaching. So it seems to be a, a natural extension of those strengths to say, well, we've produced this new thing. Let's give it to our teaching focused colleagues to test it in the wild. Yeah, that's so yeah. interesting. Yeah, I yeah. love that idea. So I'm tempted to skip over how OCW is a window into how others teach. Um, and we may be preaching to the choir, but there's this really lovely two minute quote from one of our participants about the benefits of open education. I think we should play that. Sure. So when someone says OER is not as good, I tell them my story. So many, many, many semesters ago, Pearson approached me and said, we have this new online interactive text. This is an interactive thing. Wouldn't you like to use it for your intro class? And I said, no, I would not because I use OER. But you know, this is interactive. Your students will probably do better. And I said, and if you want to give it to my students for free, I'll test it out. But no, I'm not going to just pay for something that I don't know is better than what I'm using. So it came to be that I had two fully online intro classes the same time in the summer, five weeks. And I usually dump them together in Canvas. But I agreed with Pearson. I signed a contract to do this study with them. So I keep them separate. One will get free access to the Pearson interactive business. And one will get, of course, my OER book. And then, and then they said to us, 
you realize that if there's no difference in the outcomes, we're not going to publish this study. I said, I really don't care what you do. This is merely self-serving to prove to me that my book is just as good as your book. I have no illusions that my book's better. So I had to give them, you know, strip the student names, but I had to give them all the scores for all the different things. And they ran their own tests. But of course, I teach statistics, so I'm not going to take what they say. So I ran my own tests. So I did T-tests on everything. And the only thing that one class scored better than the other was the Introduce Yourself Forum. And the OER class scored significantly higher. So maybe we could open it up to a bigger conversation with you all. We're curious um, if you have questions about our process or observations um, or suggestions. And, and the extent to which you think this, could, this kind of collaboration could work in your setting. Are, are you from a teaching-focused teaching, teaching focused institution and you've got a big research neighbor uh, you haven't talked to about OER that, that you uh, uh, might engage in a conversation or vice versa? You're at a research institution. You've got lots of, lots of great openly licensed materials sitting somewhere on campus and you, may, you might talk to your, your neighbor, the teaching-focused institution. Or does this relate to your own work with OER in other ways? Um, we would just love to hear from you and have a conversation. And we are streaming, so either you'll need to use the mic or we'll need to repeat the question. Okay. Emily is coming. Emily, I'm going to preemptively introduce you, if I may, from Metropolitan State University in Denver, which is also a Hispanic-serving institution. Yes, and it's a four-year school, but primarily undergraduate, so more, much more similar to the community colleges in this example. And I'm really excited to learn how the faculty adapt the MIT OpenCourseWare because I've looked at the resources there and I've been a little mystified as to how to use them um, in our courses. So I think this is a really important um, study or, or important work that you're doing and I look forward to learning from it. I know that we focus on really um, supporting students and having to provide maybe background information and we're going to go more slowly than I imagine they go at MIT. So have have you observed certain strategies that faculty are using at the community college to take this content that was created for a very um, high achieving, selective four-year school and apply it in a more open setting, a more open enrollment setting? I think, first of all, a great question. I think, first of all, it's a bit early to know exactly what's going to happen and, and how it's going to happen. Uh, some, some of the you know, tactics that have emerged in conversation, at least on my end, uh, range from just reusing the material whole and letting the students know, oh, this is MIT material and, you know, hoping that students are somehow in, motivated by that or inspired by that, um, to uh, updating some of the material, some of the, the statistics, some of the references, maybe the framework of the material suits the class or sparks an idea that the instructor thinks would be useful for the class, but it's perhaps not up to date you know, not, not completely current because it was made, made, made you know, created a few years ago uh, at OCW. Those are, those are the kinds of things that have come out in conversations that I've had. Yeah, I can speak to the faculty's aspirations. They've ta talked a lot about this with me and about their plans. And one thing that's come up more than once is the idea of using open courseware not necessarily and only for individual problem sets, but as a window into how courses are structured, what assignments look like what readings are assigned. And they, they're kind of like mapping that to what they currently do and then are making strategic decisions about how they want to adapt their course. So it's like connecting with a colleague, right? And that information is usually behind closed doors, but now they are given open access to see what that syllabus looks like and what the structure of the course looks like. So for me, this was like a kind of a framework shifting idea that they've provided me that open educational resources are not only the artifacts themselves, but it can be um, like a vision for how teaching happens and that the idea that that could also be open is quite powerful. Um, another idea that they've had is creating the on-ramps to get to the level that students would need to be at to, uh, to do the problem sets. They're thinking about that. Um, another idea is 
kind of mining scientific diagrams um, and then creating more inclusive alt text around them or descriptors that students um, would need to use those problem sets. So like really innovative ways of thinking about using the OER. They're not at all thinking about this as plug and play. Mm -hmm. You know, they're thinking about really interesting ways to adapt and use the material. And I know that when I had our, one of our first meetings, just the plethora of materials that are available, um, it's beyond a textbook, it's beyond an assignment, it's class notes, it's, it, there's so many ancillaries that I had never even considered. Um, that was really exciting for me as an instructional designer, for our faculty to be able to dive into those depths of course materials. And um, Shira, I don't know if you can talk about like all the diversity in regard to the types of materials. Yeah, it's really daunting <laughs> and wonderful. Um, so we have instructor insights where um, faculty talk about their process of pedagogy and teaching. And sometimes that includes episodes of Chalk Radio podcast with your host, Sarah Hansen. Um, and you could talk more about the Chalk Radio stuff if you like. Um, and there's also um, assignments, student as examples of student assignments of them completing it. Um, sometimes we have uh, full video lectures, um, lecture notes, slides. Um, there's so many more, Kurt, I'm missing. <laughs> I've seen the plethora, um, but it's really, it is, it can be very daunting. So that's actually one of the reasons I'm there is to kind of guide us all through that material together. Um, and I want you to talk about Chalk Radio and then I have a story that I think also helps illuminate how surprising this process can be for everybody involved. And if I could just before you talk about Chalk Radio, um, I think that what's very different about this project, there's so many aspects that's really different from anything we've ever done in regard to our open education work over the last 10 plus years. Um, but I think that it's, we're using one repository. And so it's a sole repository and the amount of support and scaffolding that we're providing to the faculty is more than at my institution we've ever had the staffing for. You know, we've been able to have um, an instructional designer point to some, you know, best practices. We've been able to leverage our amazing librarians um, to have help find resources, but the level of really a concierge, highly skilled, highly educated, knowledgeable concierge level of um, open education design, development, curation, support, um, that's really unprecedented from what I've seen. And one more, one more sentence about OpenCourseWare. If you, I'm guessing everybody here has spent some time on, on MIT OpenCourseWare over the years. If, like me, you haven't done it recently, check it out because there's always new stuff there, always new features and functionality. So uh, do, do reacquaint yourself with the OpenCourseWare. Also, tell us what you would like to see. So one of the faculty really wanted statistics examples from the social sciences, right? So she's pushing us to publish a new course about that. So the more we can make it a two-way street and provide what your faculty want, like that would make us very happy. <laughs> see your why we exist. Right. Yeah. Um, I always get really excited when there's an instructor insight that includes a podcast episode. So I do want you to talk a little bit about your process of um, interviewing faculty and how that ends up as part of OpenCourseWare material. Hmm. Um, well, I have the best job at MIT. I'm the world's best cocktail party guest because I get to interview MIT researchers about their work, um, their passions, their teaching. So I know a little bit about you know quantum physics, a little bit about nuclear fission and fusion, there's a difference, who knew? You probably did, I didn't. Um, and I simply interview them about how they taught with the materials on campus after they publish a course on open courseware. So these are people highly invested in open education, so that's a treat. Um, and we just have a conversation and try to understand the person behind the resources. And then we always use the podcast as a way to point to the OER so people can find them. But it's really about connecting people and people, you know, um, 
connecting through story. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to leverage that in this project to connect other educators to the faculty who are doing the work. And it requires a lot of listening. So to your question, Emily, um, thank you for asking it. I've been so surprised along the way. I would collect a bunch of courses that I thought would be applicable, right? So someone is teaching college critical reading and critical thinking, and they also teach in social health sciences. And so I started collecting things that related to the health sciences bit that we had, right? We have a course on black feminist health science studies. We have a course on gender health and marginalization through a critical feminist lens. We have a new course that we just published called Tools for Robust Science. I thought this would be like exactly what they wanted. But actually, it turns out that the gaps in this person's syllabus that they were hoping to have an OER to help fill out and expand their curriculum had to do with um, studying information and falseness. So then I could direct her to our course on media literacy in the age of deep fakes, or a it's not, well, it's a course, but it's on our open learning library and we point to it, sorting truth from fiction, um, civic online reasoning, right? Like there's all these other materials that I'm learning about that are actually, they might look on the surface to be tangentially related to their course topic, but actually that is um, a surprising, exciting new need that they might need. And it's also very helpful for me in these consultations to have someone from our digital publication specialist team who happens to be there with me and says, oh yeah, I also, as you're talking, I'm remembering this lesson plan or this student example from this other course that has nothing to do with the topic, but is actually related in terms of method or approach. Um, yeah, please come on up. W do you mind using the microphone? Thanks. Don't give him a microphone. I see my bold yeah. spot. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I don't see a blind spot. That's a first. <laughs> Open. Um, I'm, my name's Gino Fransman from Nelson Mandela University, South Africa, also the Open Ed Influences, right? So we work in the space of advocacy. And a challenge is like in the advocating, and that's why we made a course, which was awareness raising, right? So we're all speaking from the same platform. Um, and then we advocate for open or opening up as a process. And then what I've been experiencing for the last 15 years of doing this is that everyone then wants to remake the wheel and start over. So like Lisa said, we have one single repository. Whenever we advocate for opening up and then the first thing that people say is, oh, we need to make a repository. Yeah. Right? With we need to make, it, yeah. yeah? Yes. We need to make um, a, a handbook about open education. So then we get this stack of, of um, definitions and case studies and whatever. How do you go out and start with like a newbie, a newcomer into this space so that we sort of circumnavigate around that and yet empower them into being proficient, cap capable, competent, all of those nice words that say you are suitable to speak and to advocate in the space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wonder if we could actually hand this over to Joy, who designed our OER. I don't mean to put you on the spot. You don't have to. But you and your team designed this pretty incredible open OER Canvas course, which we'll give you the, um, the QR code for. But I feel like what you did in that course really addresses some of the very issues that he's raising? While Joy's coming up with the microphone, I'll say, what, to, to Gino's question, one element that in this particular project that helped is the cachet of MIT, of course. It's, it lends the credibility to people that o OER is okay, open is okay if an institution like MIT is doing it. So that, that ticks off a lot of the first steps already. So I'm from the Global South. And we don't want necessarily, uh, not we don't want, but <laughs> we need things to be contextualized, localized. So again, it's, it's in that recontextualizing and localizing that people remake a wheel with a global south accent. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer that. I think um, what I would share is what our approach was, which was, um, to build something that was very much introductory, 
but make sure that we acknowledged and addressed that very point you just made, which is now you have the opportunity to contextualize or personalize the material. So I think really what our goal was in building the training was to really pull from existing material, um, not to recreate and reinvent the wheel, but to acknowledge and honor the fact that um, so many people have created so much great work. So pulling that together in a way to offer sort of like a launch pad, if you will, um, and really highlighting the opportunity, just as you said, that now as you go and create your own or adopt your own, um, recognizing the opportunity that even adoption enables you to then personalize and contextualize um, for your students or for, you know, so there, there's still the opportunity um, to adopt something, not have to reinvent or recreate, uh, but still make it relevant. So that was sort of the approach that we took to even building like an introductory course there. As you said, there's so much that already exists. And so we wanted to honor that by just trying to pull it together in, in a meaningful way, um, but use that as sort of the launch pad to say, and now you can go do this yourself by contextualizing or calling upon the resources that already exist. Um, so I, I think again, like not necessarily always a plug and play, but an opportunity to adapt and modify in a way that can be relevant to um, individual context. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. thank you. Sure. Sarah. And I do feel like, Sarah, you probably have something to say about the desire that we have to have this come back and influence what's happening at MIT, right? Like we're not interested in being this monolithic one source of information, right? Like that's not what we're interested in doing at all. And I thought maybe you had some thoughts if you felt um, about talking about like what would it look like for it to come back and you know for us to really be in this conversation together. Yeah, I mean, I think a big dream of this is to share the adaptations back on and through open courseware so that it can speak back to the MIT community as well as to the world. Um, I think. The important thing to remember with these collaborations is that they're multi-phase. Like step one is really relationship building between people. Like you're not gonna get anywhere until you have a relationship. So before even thinking about product, it's thinking about people. Um, and only after we have established that relationship can we move on to the next phases of, okay, how do we bring more people into this conversation? How do we pull MIT faculty in? How do we have a larger table with more people um, so faculty can then really think about how to adapt their content in response to what community college faculty are doing. And, and I really appreciate that. And again, to come back to the uh, overall objectives of the project, unlike many other projects that probably many of us have been involved in, the outcome is not publish 10 open artifacts, publish 10 open textbooks, right? That's, that's not the point here to produce and reproduce and create more stuff, but rather document the learning, engage in reflection, identify next steps that could lead to that adaptation. Right. Yeah. yeah, and just an important point at the very beginning, like just to give you a sense of where we started, like one of the first questions we asked each other is how do you define open? What does that mean to your community? Before we're thinking about any sort of like product or project, it was more like just trying to understand how our communities think about open in different ways. Yeah. Um, I know that we're running out of yeah. time. Um, we do have a question in the back. Do we want to just show the QR code and then take more some more questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're going to put the QR code up here. I see someone's hand. Please yep. come on up if you don't mind. Yeah, so we have um, a number of shared resources. The course that um, we made a copy of the course that Joy created so that you all can peruse it. Um, you can get it off of Canvas Commons and make it your own. Um, also, we've created a section um, in this course of the resources that we've created so far. And as we continue, we will add resources. So um, the applications that the, the, the forms and uh, communications 
for the interest meetings, for the applications to participate in this, um, the um, ways that we've been engaging with the faculty in regard to the subject areas, the interview protocols in there. Interview yeah. protocols for the podcasts. Um, so there's a lot of really rich resources there. Um, so please go ahead and use it as much as you'd like. And um, also you can always, re or in the, um, the profiles in the app, so please reach out to us if you have any questions. We're really passionate about this. And at next year's conference, you can tell us how you've adapted the materials <laughs> yes. and, and how this has helped you form collaborations. Yes. So now we have another, another question. question. Yeah, let's. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, it's very close to my heart because I currently teach, my name is Ryan Tolden, I teach at uh, NJIT. Um, it's an R1 research institution. I grew up, my mother taught at Mercer County Community College. So, you know, I, I like seeing the collaboration. Um, if, I can, if I can make one point, and I, and I wouldn't call it a criticism, but I would not draw the line too sharply between teaching institution and research institution, because if you do research and you can't tell people about it, it doesn't work. <laughs> and likewise, if you are at one of the aforementioned teaching institutions, to violate my own rule there, right? I realize it's hard to talk about without those terms. But if you're there and you're not keeping up with what's going on, you can't make use of the great open courseware. So I think you, you really need to, to give both sides a whole lot of credit. And I, I certainly think you do. I just say the terminology can be tricky sometimes. Yes, thank you. Appreciate Thank you. that. Yeah. Point well yes. taken. Yeah. Are we so down to our last five minutes? Any others? We'd love to hear your comments. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for this talk. This is very exciting. I wanted to say that, um, so my name is Sarah Kresh. I work at the City University of New York in a four-year institution uh, for adults with interrupted undergraduate education. So, um, And when I work with faculty, just like the first person who asked the question, when we look at MIT OpenCourseWare, it's, it's rarely something they ever even consider using with our student population. So what I'm thinking will come out of this project is adaptations that our faculty could then further adapt for our own population. And I'm wondering, in the spirit of not invent, reinventing the wheel, um, are, are these going to be in the same repository? Where are we going to find these? Yeah, so each of the community colleges, they have places where, like, where they like to share open educational resources. So I'll le maybe you can share where they may be. We, we don't have a good single place. That's, that's okay. part of the issue. You know, if we, if we produce an open textbook, we put it into a big, massive PDF and throw it up on our website and put it in Google Docs so everybody mm -hmm. can download it and edit it. But we don't have, we don't have a great place, actually. And uh, Arab, our re fairly recent practice is that everything that's created through any of our funding opportunities are put into Pressbooks. If it's not a textbook that fits in Pressbooks, then we put a summary with a link to where it can be found. Mm -hmm. So if it's built into, we use Canvas as a learning management system, we put a summary page with the course competencies and the mapping of that so that, and then a link to where it could be found. And, and we have an interest in sharing the adaptations through open courseware. I guess my problem is like, how do I let you know <laughs> that it's there and when it's mm -hmm. ready? So I think we need to open up a communication channel with other institutions to let them know where to find these adaptations. And also yeah. the ways that we organize our site, like we have collections on the site that we feature. So we have an Africana collection, so we have a climate change collection. You can go and see all the OCW material on that topic. So that might be one possibility for us where we can feature it really prominently and easily to find to see what that adaptations might be. Yeah. I just want to suggest that specifically having one place where people can come find the content that comes out of this project, I think would be of interest to a lot of people. Thank because you. the issue that we've had with those open courseware is that it's just pitched too, mm -hmm. too high. Uh -huh. and yeah our faculty don't have the time to adapt it that much. Yeah. So if somebody else does that first step, <laughs> yeah, yeah. then we can customize it for awesome. our students, our Thank adults you. in New York City. Perfect. Fantastic, Thank thanks you. so Thank much, Sarah. Oh. We are down to two minutes. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. I just wondered if there's any notion of, uh, as part of this collaboration, actually 
bringing the faculty together, the faculty from MIT, the faculty from the community colleges, and then allowing or enabling some at least dialogue between them because I think that's often the missing part mm -hmm. about uh, reuse and repurposing and adaptation is that we expect it to be done autonomously. You've created this thing and now autonomously you're gonna change it or adapt mm -hmm. it. But I think actually it might be more fruitful to think about communities of practice of faculty collaborating together mm -hmm. on both initial creation and its subsequent adaptation. And it seems like a natural extension to what you've already got going. Awesome. Yeah, I think in March we're all going to get together. Is that right? That's 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 the plan. That's, that's the what plan. we wrote. Yeah. But, we yeah, but the MIT faculty won't be at that. And right. I think what your that's point is is that really they need point. to be brought into that. And, and I agree. So I think that would be an excellent like next phase yeah. of how to build it out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I see we're at time. Yeah. But I want to I want to thank the OE Global team for hosting this, putting this together, uh, to the opportunity to be here with everybody. A uh, great shout out to the Norquist College team. They are just dynamite. Uh, so thanks to Norquist College and OE Global. And thank you online, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.